Yeah, Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings Magazine with the U.S. Naval Institute. Uh, welcome to the first panel discussion of West. This panel is titled, Needle, needle Gun on the Roof. <laughs> Uh, it's taking is, shots already. That, it's like being on the O3 level of a carrier, right? Uh, what are the major naval warfare communities doing to restore readiness and build a more lethal force? Before we get started, I want to thank and recognize uh, General Dynamics for sponsoring this morning's session. They're recognized here today by Lee Palmer, Executive Vice President of General Dynamics Information Technology Defense Group. As you know, we cannot hold these events without the support of our sponsors. So thank you to General Dynamics for helping us sponsor this uh, important discussion. I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator for this morning's panel, Vice Admiral Retired Jim Zortman. Admiral Zortman is a 1973 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, a career naval aviator. He commanded Medium Attack Weapons School Pacific, Attack Squadron 52, Carrier Air Wing 17, Carrier Group 7, the USS John C. Stennis Strike Group in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. His final assignment on active duty was as Commander Naval Air Forces, or the Air Boss, here in San Diego. Admiral Zortman is a leader who understands being on both sides of the provider and user sides of readiness and lethality, which makes him a great candidate to be our panel moderator today. So Admiral Zortman, over to you. Thanks, Bill. I uh, appreciate that, and uh, we're going we're gonna to get right into things. Uh, there's a number of you out there in the audience that uh, sit in these things, have sat on these things, uh, so it's a, it's a well-informed and, I think, uh, an active group. This is a great panel, I think, to kick off the, uh, the, the West Conference this year. Uh, for those of you that heard CNO, uh, he uh, made a motion, and it carried nearly unanimously to get past thinking about lethality and thinking about improving readiness to what are we doing. And it, uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, we were a little bit ahead of CNO. Uh, we've, we spent some time uh, talking to each other over the last week or so, and that was exactly the tack that we decided to take. Uh, we're we're going to do uh, a little bit different here. We're not going to spend a lot of time introducing everybody that's up here. Uh, you know who these people are, and if you don't, uh, somebody probably within a foot or two of you does. They're the type commanders and the leaders of uh, the aviation, the surface, the subsurface, the information, the special warfare uh, communities. Uh, they represent research, and they represent all of the things that are done to prepare forces to be ready to fight today, to be re ready to fight six or 18 months from now. They are going to talk about what they are doing to today to make the force more lethal, more ready, and um, what that's going to lead into is a session a little bit later on this afternoon where you're going to hear the fleet commanders talk about how they take those forces that these warfare commanders are sending them, and then they position them, they maneuver them, they put them in the right posture and how they're going to fight them as bigger, bigger units. So w what we agreed to do is rather than each of them giving a, a opening statement, uh, we're going to go right into questions. And what we're going to do is uh, ask a question to uh, each of them and then ask any of the other panel members that uh, want to add on to that or, or challenge any of the things that they said. And as we go through that, you'll see microphones throughout the uh, audience here. And that's the audience participation part of this thing. Uh, we can wait till the end, but if you got a question or an area that you think we need to address right up front, then let's get that on the table so we don't run out of time and lose it. So with that, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, when we start down in an operation or a fight someplace, uh, we expect that we're going to do a lot of battle space preparation. And part of that battle space preparation is often done by uh, the Naval Special Warfare Community. So I'm going to throw the first question down to them. Uh, and there's, they've been involved in a, in a continuous high-end fight uh, for going on 20 years, and uh, you can make the argument uh, even before that. So with that, um, Admiral Green, what, what is it that, that Special Warfare is doing to continue in that fight and the innovation and the other things that are required to get to the lethality 
and the kind of readiness that's going to be really required for this bigger high end fight. Well, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks for, for making me go first. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, but we're, uh, you know, as I look at what the CNO said and, and, and what the strategic environment is and, and what the direction is, we're, we've really got to balance kind of how we're evolving. Um, we can't forget the CDEO fight. We've been in that fight for 17 years and uh, have learned a lot and, and paid a lot. But uh, where, where I'm going is, is trying to develop an NSW our nation needs or expects with the new strategic environment and the, uh, and the direction and, and, and a return of great power competition and, and dealing with rogue regimes like DPRK and, and, and Iran. So. Um, as NSW, we've really had an evolution since 1940 where every 20 years we've had to evolve or adapt again to a force our nation needs. So a lot of what we're trying to do, we've got a sense of urgency, we've got to be bold, uh, we've got to play chess versus checkers. So we, we, the, the how that we're getting there is what we're calling force optimization and that's really a, a realignment of our force from what I'll call from headquarters to edge. Um, and how we're evolving to kind of meet and be a good partner with the Navy, but also uh, our joint and our soft responsibilities. And really that's three things we're doing. Uh, it's really kind of a return to basics at the headquarters level. We've, inve we've invested heavily in an innovation directorate, uh, and we've returned to what is called our five. We do a lot of war gaming and experimentation. And really that's kind of, uh, I'll call it a whiteboard session, uh, where we're, we're leveraging uh, creative problem solvers to develop soft options to support that great power competition or to continue, again, I would call the CDEO piece is probably, uh, it's more like crime, it's, it's steady state, it's a new normal, it's not going away, so we gotta kinda deal with that. At the group levels, which is our 06 levels, um, we're developing 06 task forces that can swing and support unpredictably and flexibly steady state campaign, contingency, and then, as we've all talked about, uh, hopefully not if and when, but, but O-plan development. So we've got to train, certify, and exercise those six task forces to do that. The other thing we're doing is we're merging our surface, um, surface combatant and undersea commands into a mobility operations group. And we see a lot of synergy with resourcing and acquisition and innovation in partnership with the Navy to kind of expand that. And then down at the Echelon 4, the SEAL teams were, were trying to expand SEAL capacity <clears throat> to stand up a new SDV team and a dry combat submersible again that will provide a lot of capability um, uh, in partnership with, with the Navy. Um, but but I've, I've just promulgated a vision, it's called Vision 2030 and it's really about strength and compete and reform. And really the strength in peace is the essence of our community has always been creative problem solvers with a bias for action, call it thoughtful ruthlessness, but guys that move into the space in, uh, in, in calculated risks and uncertainty. And, and it's really kind of cultivating that uh, in our new strategic environment uh, to do things. I think our, our, our value proposition is really we can support the high end, but it's really short of armed conflict, irregular warfare, phase zero, gray zone. I think a lot of what we're working on right now with the Navy is how do we create dilemmas, disrupt, degrade, uh, to support other elements of our national power as we try to compete, which is a continuum. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, but really, our value proposition as we move forward, we can't, we can't take our eye off the CDO piece, but we've got to kind of adapt and evolve in partnership, and we've got a great partnership with the Navy to kind of do those things uh, short of armed conflict that will contribute uh, to that competition piece with great powers. Thank, thanks. Um, Admiral Cottle, uh, you're, you're the commander of the submarine force in the Pacific, and uh, there we've got a rich tradition of the fight in the Pacific. Uh, you, as you look at uh, what you're doing today, if maybe one of the most famous submariners from World War II, Admiral Lockwood, would to come back and sit down and ask you and say, what are you doing to have this force be as lethal and as ultimately effective as the submarine force was in the Pacific in World War II? 
what, how would you answer him? Well, I think you would first say, uh, hey, Daryl, didn't you get the memo on the correct uniform to wear? <laughs> but now I got some other speaking engagements uh, that I'm going to right after this. But, uh, you know, I think he'd be pretty pleased. And one of the things that we learned uh, coming out of World War II in the submarine force is really, no kidding, being ready day one. And uh, we talk a lot about it, but in the submarine force, we feel a, a tremendous burden on us to make sure that when any O plan is executed, at the heart of that, who is tenderizing the battlefield out there in the maritime, is going to be a significant submarine force that's ready and highly capable. So it takes a lot to do that. Uh, we deliver about 10 to 12 submarines around the world, SSNs, 24-7, 365, five SSBNs on deterrent patrols, 365, and it takes quite an infrastructure to pull that off. As we have shifted a little bit uh, in the last couple years toward trying to strike the balance, as Colin talked about, by the way, who we have a great relationship with our soft friends, to getting the balance right between peacetime missions, which have traditionally been ISR focused, toward combat readiness. And we've done a lot of things to do that. And I'll just go through a few of those very quickly. First, we want to expand well beyond ADCAP and TLAM. So when it comes down to it, you know, the CNO talked today about the blurry line of the different phases of uh, conflict, but eventually they all go kinetic. And when you seize the initiative part of that, I want everyone in the room here to be thinking about the submarine force. We are going to be the force that is going to get seize the initiative right. And so we are bridging a gap to our maritime strike uh, tomahawk in the interim with bringing harpoon back. And so we decommissioned that system a, about a decade and a half ago, and um, um, we made a decision that we still needed a little bit more standoff capability. So we tasked our technical community to build a system to bridge that into our combat control system, and we actually did a successful launch of Harpoon during RIMPAC. And uh, so you're going to see us use these 120 Harpoons we have left and get those on our ship to kind of bridge that. We're still in a very robust spiral development, continuous improvement of our combat control systems. So that's how we're kind of handling that piece. We are singularly focused on making sure that everything we do to build our people is about combat. And to that end, I think we have a pretty good submarine command course. In fact, I would say it's the gold standard of how to build a combat ready commander. So we have shifted that, uh, those underway periods to be high end combat operations. Instead of doing a lot of peacetime, shallow water, high contact density, kind of ISR stuff, it's all about combat and delivering violent effects. We have changed the name of our tactical readiness evaluation to combat readiness evaluation. And while there's, that seems like just a name change, the whole focus of that examination has changed. So when you complete that exam, you are combat surge ready. And then the last one is we've developed a CO and XO curriculum to try to make that level of command smart on our O plans. If you've worked in the business of operational plans, you know they're highly classified, typically ACCMs, hard to get a hold of, and it's hard for that, that O5 commander to really understand what is it I'm exactly going to do if we actually kick one of those off. So we, we're trying to bridge that gap. The, th the third piece is our interoperability with allies. Last year, I kicked off a submarine commanders conference where we actually got a bunch of folks in the room at my level, the respective commanders of their submarine forces, for the first time that that's ever been done. And a lot of these folks don't necessarily like each other. And so, uh, but when you start talking about the mission and about delivering uh, combat effects, we all have a lot of things in common, and so we're able to do that. And the second one is going to be in April, where we're going to bring those folks again in. And I tend to put it in Hawaii, which doesn't bother anyone, and I tie it to my submarine ball, which they enjoy as well. Um, but we improved our participation in our uh, SEC, our submarine commanders course, by bringing in some of those countries like Japan and Australia into that. In fact, right now, one of the reasons I'm in blues is the Asian Pacific submarine conference is going on with 15 uh, international partners at my level again, talking about uh, the, the uh, undersea and submarine rescue. And we just completed exercise Gray Lady, which we actually had the opportunity in our static range at our uh, noise facility uh, up in CFAC to actually mate our undersea rescue capability to an actual uh, Virginia-class submarine, the first time we've actually proven that that capability exists. And the last thing is just very robust tactical development. 
We are fielding so many things in the submarine force that are autonomous, things that we can launch out of every opening in that submarine. And to command and control that and learn how to employ that effectively in the combat environment is a big piece of that. And we're pushing that down to the squadron level and letting these commanders at the major commander level figure out this and being kind of an expanded brain trust of how to go after that. Seabed warfare is a big piece of that. So you're going to see a huge initiative coming from the undersea on how we actually develop target sets and understand how we can actually fight in the seabed warfare of that part of our domain as well. So that kind of wraps it, sir. Okay. Uh, Admiral Brown, uh, there, there's an environment that uh, naval forces have always operated in, in information, and it's how to move the right information, communicate it when it don't get it lost in a stovepipe. The, the stand-up of the information warfare community and the information warfare commander has been hotly argued in a lot of corners. So could you tell us a little bit about what information warfare is doing to make the force more lethal and more ready? Right. I'll, I'll, thanks. Can you hear me? It's way over there. Um, I'll, I'll hit two highlights uh, for what we're doing uh, across the information warfare enterprise. One will be about uh, readiness, which really will span the entire front. Uh, C5I readiness will, will span the, uh, the front row here. And the second piece will be about how we're building capability into our force that we're putting afloat and forward and how we're leveraging that piece. The first thing I'll talk about is uh, we've recently stood up an information warfare enterprise, which all the folks up here are, are part of, uh, in addition to um, all the systems commands and uh, all the PEOs that involve the, the IW platform. When you think about the information warfare platform, which has to span uh, cyber, SIGINT, intelligence, meteorology and oceanography, it's the backbone network, um, it's the tactical data links. Uh, and you think about that holistically and trying to create a continuum, it, go, it spans from shore, it spans to sea, it's the human element, it's the machine element, it's the spectral element, and it's the data element. And uh, that's kind of an unwieldy, uh, unwieldy thing that we're trying to get our hands around. We created an information warfare enterprise to try to handle that with focus uh, in several areas. And one of them is improving the readiness of C5I uh, afloat during the OFRP. And so partnering with my, uh, my fellow TICOMs, uh, we've, we've just kicked off this uh, wholeness campaign uh, which has three focus areas. One's kind of getting after the current operational uh, availability and readiness of the systems we have today. Um, that's primarily being led by our FRD par partners at Spay War, uh, but we're, uh, we're moving out and trying to figure out how we align uh, to the various maintenance and, and modernization uh, plans to keep those on track uh, and aligned with the resource sponsor and the PEOs. A second area we're working on is in uh, what would be considered like the design area or the, the wholeness and capability. Uh, partnering heavy with, uh, with Spay War and PEO C4I on that. It's about the design element of the equipment we have out, uh, out, out there, how we spare to it, how we do maintenance against it, and some of these other things that have not been normalized, I think, in the C4I arena um, uh, completely. And in that in that vein as well, we're reaching out across into the PEO, IWS, and uh, NAVC arenas to try to link the combat system side more tightly to the C4I side because it really is a single continuum from battle space awareness to targeting. And lastly, we're trying to get our processes together and understand the C2 of how we generate IW readiness. Um, I tell you, any, at any given point, there's about 57,000 uh, information warriors out there that we count. Um, I have under my domain only about 19,000 of them, so the, the remainder of them are in these gentlemen's uh, 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 areas for uh, man train and equip as well as the joint force. Uh, so I have to be able to kind of leverage, leverage that. So we're going after that in a big way, uh, working through this process that we're calling the C5I wholeness, and I'll be happy to take more questions on there. Uh, the second thing that we're doing uh, with re regard to developing uh, uh, lethality in the fleet is really centered around the information warfare commander afloat concept. Uh, we've been after that for a couple years, uh, solidifying how we are generating those information warfare commanders afloat. And today, um, I think we, the very last, I would call legacy IWC, which was really the N6 on board, an IP officer, the rest of them are all now screened um, officers who've gone through 100-day uh, training tracks and tailored to uh, their backgrounds. 
Uh, they represent every specialty in the information warfare community. So oceanographers out there, I have intelligence officers out there, IPs and CWs, uh, standing those. Um, as, as I've been following the, uh, the backside of all the post-deployment briefs, most recently I got one from uh, Admiral Gene Black coming back off Arias Truman and uh, kind of the first dynamic force employment. Uh, to, a, to a T, every, every uh, commander's coming back and, and basically talking about how that capability that we're generating out there is really bringing to, in, together and harnessing um, the facets of the information warfare community in a way that we haven't been able to do before and providing them the, the, the maneuver space and the posturing that they need for the high-end fight um, from, from port uh, to, to uh, uh, four deployed areas. And so that's a, we're really getting after that. So General Wartman, uh, Admiral Lockwood left the room and uh, General Smith and General Vandegrift showed up and they said, okay, uh, here we are a number of years later, uh, you're running the war fighting lab, you're the assistant uh, for naval research, and they ask you the question, what, what is it that you're doing in the Marine Corps today to be more lethal and ready than they were when they were fighting it out on Saipan and Guadalcanal? Yes, sir. Appreciate the question. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be with you. Uh, I'd emphasize just a couple of points, sir, and uh, really kind of uh, uh, reinforcing Admiral Green and Admiral Cottle. Um, you know, mindset and focus uh, matters an awful lot. So Secretary Mattis, National Defense Strategy, said, hey, we're back in the business of great power competition. Uh, we've got high-end adversaries, and we have to uh, respect uh, their capabilities. Uh, so to focus uh, our uh, readiness, to focus our lethality efforts, uh, in that direction is a critical element of uh, you know, providing the right kind of capabilities for the joint force. Uh, so the Commandant in the uh, uh, Marine Operating Concept uh, cited a couple of things that we think are particularly important. Uh, the first is uh, increasingly contested maritime domains. And uh, because we have this uh, expectation that the maritime domains are going to be contested, he said we've got to be completely integrated with the Navy. Uh, so we're back in a big way to the business of applying fleet marine forces uh, in support of uh, uh, sea control campaigns, in support of maritime operations. And for, for us, what that means is we want to be able to provide uh, to the fleet, uh, to the assets uh, uh, afloat, uh, to the entire naval force, the ability to do you know, what is uh, often described as distributed and cooperative uh, sensing, fires, command and control, and uh, in information warfare. So for all the type commanders and all the uh, uh, warfare specialties that are represented here, we want to be able to sense the environment for them and we want to be able to benefit from the sensing uh, that they're doing. Uh, we want to be able to shoot for them uh, in a third party cooperative manner or we want to be able to have that put them in a position where they can take a shot uh, off of our sensors. Uh, we want to be able to apply information warfare capabilities in a manner that benefits uh, their survivability and we want to have command and control, naval command and control capabilities in the right places to extend the reach uh, of our fleet commanders uh, and uh, their composite warfare commanders. Uh, so uh, this business of orientation and mindset is kind of a critical, uh, critically important uh, component of that. Uh, to set the foundation for that, uh, we're really focused uh, on our service level uh, training exercises and then the exercises that are being executed by our Marine Expeditionary Forces and the numbered fleets. Uh, as it relates to our service level training exercises, the Commandant has us in the, bi the business in a big way uh, of fighting against capable adversary forces. Adversary forces that have electronic warfare tools, cyber tools, sophisticated intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, and sophisticated uh, strike capabilities. Uh, and uh, we know that if we're going to uh, you know, get in the ring with a prize fighter, uh, we've got to have a capable sparring partner. Uh, and then our Marine Expeditionary Forces uh, and our numbered fleets are back to the business of fleet and MEF level uh, exercises and experimentation, thinking about uh, applying their capabilities in an integrated uh, manner that provides uh, maximum benefit across the, uh, the entire naval service. Uh, the Commandant uh, has established uh, MEF information groups, so has uh, pioneered the development of information warfare capabilities uh, in the Marine Corps, and that's all about uh, being able to sense the environment, ben benefit from sensing that's going on uh, across the joint force, uh, to be able to maintain our networks uh, under real pressure, uh, and then to be able to provide the right kind of command and control tools to the naval force 
uh, that uh, our commanders and our small unit leaders uh, can fight from. There's a significant maintenance component to it, uh, perhaps not the sexy uh, end of uh, warfighting readiness, um, but uh, a concerted, enduring uh, investment to drive down our not mission capable maintenance, not mission capable supply uh, rates. It's really paying off uh, for the Marine Corps uh, in important ways. Um, would uh, emphasize the point that uh, people matter a lot, so bringing the right kind of talent uh, in the front door and then training and educating them, uh, giving them the right kind of critical thinking and analytical skills, and then uh, conditioning them to operate with high levels of initiative in a really aggressive manner uh, that is uh, influenced and in, in shaped by uh, higher headquarters intent. Um, at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, we're a little bit more uh, future-oriented, but we're in the business as a naval team uh, of developing the right kind of capabilities and concepts uh, for the future fight, uh, putting them out on a game board for uh, wargaming, and then taking them into uh, to live force experimentation. Uh, and if we get that right on the front end, uh, we're not talking you know, stuff that's uh, out there way beyond the horizon. Just a couple years, we'll field uh, capability that are really going to challenge uh, the adversaries that are identified in the national defense strategy. Uh, so we're excited about uh, where we are, and we're also excited about where we're going as a naval team uh, as we look to, uh, to the near future. So, Air Boss, you've, uh, you, Naval Aviation's uh, been recapitalizing a lot of the force over the last uh, five to ten years. Uh, with the charge of lethality and readiness, can you talk about how that recapitalized force is being put together and some concrete examples of how it's more ready and more lethal than it was five years ago? You bet. Um, first off, I think what you're going to see is an awful lot of similarities between all the uh, panelists as force generators. Our job is to man, train, and equip deployable combat-ready forces that win in combat. And that whole vision and what aligns us, as General Wortman just talked about, is that um, national defense strategy that said, hey, uh, let's get more lethal and, and let's be ready for that high-end fight. And so you're going to see the activities that we're doing to prepare for that uh, are going to be very similar in, in nature. So for us in naval aviation, what we really have been working on recently is developing our plan. And, and when you say a plan, it should be easy, but it's getting alignment throughout the entire naval aviation enterprise uh, to execute a plan that generates 80% of the airplanes that we own that are mission capable and ready to fight and win. So to do that, we've been uh, undergoing an awful lot of reform. Uh, and we're reforming across the board. Uh, we're reforming and we're calling the, the, this new reform effort, if we will, the Naval Sustainment Strategy. So that strategy will allow us to be able to not only uh, sustain the aircraft we have as we recapitalize, sustain the newly recapitalized aircraft, but be able to do that at a, at a rate that's at 80% of the aircraft that we own. The plan also involves um, alignment and governance. So we have to realign ourselves with respect to governance, and we're doing that with um, pillars and pillar leads, and I'll get a little bit more into that. And then we're underpinning all of our reform efforts with big data analytics so that we're actually uh, working in truth and we're being predictive in the steps that we're taking uh, to be able to improve our readiness. So our pillars are taking some uh, best practices from commercial industry with surge as far as how do we uh, maximize the airplanes that we have to get some quick wins to get airplanes that are up and, uh, and flying, uh, reform within our squadrons, uh, everything from the way we're uh, indoctrinating our sailors when they first report aboard to how we provide ready, relevant learning through them throughout their entire tour uh, in, in their squadrons. Through the way we maintain our airplanes uh, at our AIMDs and at our depots, and we're seeing significant improvements recently with uh, those reform efforts. Uh, also improving the way we do our supply chain and how we're uh, repairing repairables, you know, broken parts, and how we're uh, buying uh, our, our new parts for the airplanes that we have. And then engineering reform as well, everything from reliability control boards that get into our components uh, to how we're responding and providing engineering support throughout the force. So all of these efforts uh, are, comprise our plan, uh, our activities are aligned to that plan, and then we hold ourselves accountable to that plan. With respect to recapitalization, 
uh, interesting, just walking the, the floor today, you can see examples of that recapitalization uh, with an awful lot of new metal, with P8s replacing our P3s, with uh, um, continuing to upgrade our MH60s and our F18 series F35s with VFA 147 just uh, uh, becoming safe for flight, our very first F35C squadron, and that'll be uh, uh, joining our air wings very soon. Uh, to go back to the lethality piece, then all those tactics as we bring fifth gen and fourth gen together, if you will, we kind of commonly call to that as uh, Gen 9 uh, air wings that we're going to be having s soon, those tactics, techniques, and procedures to make and maximize lethality within our air wings. Uh, the growler continues to uh, e evolve and, and add into that lethality. And then, um, of course, adding our unmanned aircraft with MQ-25 onto our flight decks as well as Triton, which will EOC later this year. So everything from the, the other TICOMs I'm talking about as far as maximizing what we have today, uh, recapitalizing for the future, training our sailors and our aviators and our warfighters to be able to, to better um, fight, and then the integrated nature with which we fight is, gets into how we all work together to increase our lethality in the future. Admiral Boxel, you've uh, here pinch hitting for Admiral Brown, and uh, so you bring a, a different perspective in that you're coming from Washington. I'm going to ask you to take your Washington hat off and talk about what the surface force in the lessons they've learned and what, how they're applying them for a more ready force today based on some of the challenges you've had to face over the last year. Now, Roger, thank you, sir. And also thank you for letting me go last and also for sitting in the straddle seat here between the two tables. That's awesome. <laughs> but uh, It's the world you live in. So it it really is. It's symbolic, isn't it? Um, and, and actually it is, uh, whether you're in Washington or whether you're in the waterfront in Norfolk or, or San Diego or Japan, uh, we do have a very clear direction in both the Navy, the nation needs, which is really more my lane in that future force of generation of capability and capacity, uh, and then the Navy the nation has, and how we're taking what we have in execution in the next year to two to try to get what we can out there and change the way we're doing business to get after. Uh, I was also wondering which uh, World War II admiral you're going to uh, make me t talk about, but uh, I appreciate you not doing that. Uh, it's, it's actually Scott who taught the cruisers how to shoot, but that's over to you. Fair, fair. So, um, so I can talk ad nauseum about the things we're bringing on for future capability, and I will do that. But I think really in the interest of readiness, there's future and current. And looking at current, if you, any of you have heard Admiral Brown speak in the last, not this Admiral Brown, but uh, Vice Admiral Brown, the surface guy, he's talked about you know, this uh, culture of compliance versus a culture of excellence. And... Uh, you can say that all day long. You can say, oh, well, I want to be a, an excellent, I want to have excellence over compliance. Who doesn't want that? But really the things that drive how you get to a culture of excellence is really what is changing in the near term and I would argue is already in progress. And so uh, a couple examples. What are we doing today? I mean, obviously we have, uh, we know we've had uh, the, the accidents in, that happened a couple years ago have now, uh, we, we've done a lot of soul searching. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, money, over a billion dollars in, in things that will get out there very quickly, improvements to radars, training, fidelity. Um, but I think that kind of pales in comparison to really the, the sea change we've had in returning back to basics, uh, as someone I think Daryl talked about. Uh, this is something that I think has gotten everyone's attention. As you look at the great power competition and this kind of uh, slap in the face of we've got to do more and better with what we have to get after uh, improving our capability as best we can today. We can't wait to do it as to this new capability comes out. And so what are we doing there? Well, certainly immediately uh, we have looked uh, very closely at the things we've improved in, in navigation and seamanship. Uh, the fidelity of trainers, not just what we have out there. What we have is what we're going to have for a little while till we make those improvements. Uh, but the types of scenarios that we're doing. Uh, and so that's, that's one side on the, on the navigation seamanship. But if you look at the readiness out there and how we're going out to COM 2Xs, what are those commanding officers doing today uh, and what will they be doing in the next few months? Uh, there's been an overhaul of uh, our Surface Forces Readiness Training Manual, uh, which really is that document that drives what you need to accomplish before you take your forces forward. And we have been a compliant force. We've, 
we've learned through you know, mistakes we've made or things we've wanted to achieve or we just our, our own assessment of what we need to improve on. And we, we've created a constantly changing document that every uh, other surf war that's in here has done the same thing. But right now we've pushed that to say, hey, maybe we've done too much of, of you know, dot by dot, you have to do this before you do that and then you do that. And, and it gets very rote and very, uh, probably it, it gets watered down because the desire is I just gotta check those things off the block. Vice the shift now, which is more, uh, hey, I have to go make my forces as best I can. And taking that same readiness preparation group, the afloat training groups out there, and say, uh, how do I make them less assessors and more trainers? So those commanding officers can assess their ships and say, this is what I need to do. And let's focus them on the time that they have at sea, rather than say, you have this many weeks of training to accomplish all your objectives. Say, here's the things you have to do uh, and give you more time to to exercise your right as the commanding officer to uh, tell us what you think you need to get better at. And by the way, we need to put more trust and, and uh, leadership uh, into your uh, support networks of training and uh, you know, across the board. So, so we're still working through that. The Surface Force Training Manual has just come out. We start with the first two ships that will go through that. And we expect to see a lot of time return back to the commanding officers, uh, not just to to get back home and stay at sea less, but to use the remaining amount of time that we palm for uh, to go do the things that we think will make them much better. Uh, and I think that's very similar to how we would do it back uh, in World War II uh, to say, hey, no one was telling those COs what to do and that they had to do all these things. We were throwing everything we could at them to say, what do you need, what we can support you with, and you shift that mindset. So, so to me, in the current readiness side, Admiral Brown is not here, but I, I guarantee you, he would tell you about the culture of excellence that we have to create, and it starts by uh, putting the commanding officer at the center of the problem again and make all those support networks back to uh, giving him or her those assets they need to succeed. Okay, I, I'm going to, if anybody wants to line up at the microphones, we'll be happy to start taking that. I'm going to put a question out here, and this isn't directed at any specific person, but I'd, I'd, I'd ask uh, that we get a couple answers to it. Uh, force has been under a lot of stress in how we've run the force. Uh, deployment schedules, back-to-back -back deployments, in, dependent on the platform and the particular warfare unit. As we talk about a lethal and ready force in a high-end fight, uh, invite anybody to comment on what is being done to stress the force at a unit level under personal conditions. In other words, when the hole gets blown in the side of the ship, when the hole gets electronic hole gets blown in the network, when the conditions are physically and mentally challenging at a level that we don't necessarily see in the kind of ops that we're doing today, uh, there's always exceptions to that. But are there significant changes being made in the way that we're preparing and then training at the level that you're working at to address that kind of a scenario. And whoever wants to go first can go first. I'll kick it off. You know, that is one of the toughest things to do, uh, is how to create a tough and resilient sailor that knows how to uh, handle the, uh, the eventuality of taking a round uh, the eventuality of having a main space fire or flooding in one of our ships or, or uh, aircraft, how to not be in the fetal position in the corner when that event occurs, but man your panel and, uh, and work through that. So how do you do that in peacetime? It is a challenge. So the way we're taking that on, at least in the submarine force, and I think most of the team up here would probably have similar stories, is condition our sailors and officers through the lens of war fighting and combat in every single thing we do. That's the lens by which we want to view all of our missions. And hopefully by doing that, you'll kind of asymptotically approach this toughness that's needed in combat. You can't guarantee it, but I think it's the only way you can go about it. So this is how we train. This is the scenarios we're at sea doing. This is how we're actually uh, demonstrating what the, uh, the adversary looks like. This is robust red teaming. This is simulating the, uh, the conditions by which we're going to actually be in, in combat. And, and it's making all of the peacetime missions viewed in and through the lens of war fighting. And by doing that, we hope we're building tough and resilient sailors. I'm gonna hop in too. Uh, for anybody here, I imagine a lot of you have read uh, Jim Hornfisher's books, uh, you know, Fleet at Flood Tide, Neptune's Inferno, et cetera. And I gotta tell you that uh, I think when I read those, that's probably the first time that I really kind of 
thought about the absolute gore that is war, whether you're ashore or at sea, but certainly at sea for me as a commanding officer of a ship and thinking about the types of things my crew had to endure in a daily day-to-day. -day. Uh, and so to me, there's two sides of this. You, know, you can't automatically say to your crew, hey, you know, we need to go practice how bloody and gory that's going to be because it is. But I think you can talk about understanding how you expect those crews to react and training them for that very real eventuality that happens either whether you're at war or in peacetime in an accident uh, that you need we need to talk about that because there are very real and understood reactions that happen that we need to all have a have a sense of what the impact of that's going to be on your readiness to fight uh, we are doing those things we're doing those things at surface warfare officer school we're doing it at boot camp uh, but uh, but it, you know really I, you know, I'll, I'll be interested to see how this, we, we just kind of shifted back to this, uh, you know, this recommitment to that warfighting aspect from a resilience and toughness standpoint. You've heard the CNO talk about it. Um, when you start getting down to uh, the detail of it, it is very, very tough. Uh, it's tough to go through. Uh, we're t teaching our commanding officers uh, how to get through training at SWAS uh, in conditions that I didn't have to go through in training, which, which were going to be in sleep-deprived conditions. They're going to be through uh, stressful conditions of a lot of things happening at once, like it will happen when it happens for real. Uh, is it going to mimic exactly what they'll see? Probably not. Um, will it uh, give us an opportunity to understand that we will see huge differences in performance and that expectation and to be prepared for those things? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, as we go down this path, I think it will get better. I think we will get better with the ability to uh, simulate some things, but you can't simulate uh, uh, death and destruction. Uh, so, so there's, there's uh, pieces to this that I think uh, we, we do have our crew's attention. The, the, the uh, MCPON has moved to, to a very um, proactive strategy with the, with the chief's messes, and uh, he wants them to be prepared at the deck plate level, uh, taking lessons learned from both uh, recent examples and World War II examples. Just to pile on just a, a little bit, Ron, you, not to have much to add to that, but there's a saying that says your performance in combat never raises to the level of your expectation. It always falls to the level of your training. And I think, you know, we've seen that play itself out over and over and over. So to the point of realistic training, to the point that national defense strategy says high-end fight, let's prepare. Uh, it, it does involve that leader development, it involves the sailor development, it involves the mental discussions that we're having with our sailors on a daily basis with our leaders, and that's all folded into leader development strategy that every single one of us has in every single one of our communities, and I think you'll see great alignment along that. Okay. Let's take a question from the floor. Hi, Justin Katz, Inside Defense. Uh, Admiral Caudill, if I could single you out, I'm sorry. Uh, you briefly hit on the fact that the Navy is going to start uh, recertifying the harpoons for the SSN uh, 668 class uh, as kind of a bridge for whatever the next tomahawk is going to look like. Uh, could you lay out a little bit more on that in terms of what the way forward is? I guess specifically, uh, you know, are there plans to start re-exercising that capability once you've worked out the recertification with Boeing? And also, you know, at least from the media perspective, it's not clear uh, when that next tomahawk is, is going to start taking form. So how, how long do you expect this bridge to last? Thank you. That's, um, to the time period on the bridge, I mean, I expect that to be, you know, in the, in the five-year kind of time frame. So that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Um, integrating this uh, capability seamlessly into our combat control system uh, which now is kind of a standalone capability that we had to do kind of as a one of to make sure we could communicate to the weapon, take uh, off hole targeting and actually execute that mission through uh, the harpoon system is um, was kind of a, a demonstration that's now going to go into the production in our next combat control spiral development. So you'll see that uh, kind of being rolled out in our normal time frame that we do that. So we do about seven submarines, five to seven submarines uh, a year. Uh, if I had to, I could put the temporary system on uh, any of the 688 combat control systems and, uh, and, and field that quicker, but that's the kind of uh, rollout plan that I think you'll see. The mix in the torpedo room, which is uh, obviously uh, 
We're always trying to get that balance right of what we've got in our torpedo room between ADCAP torpedoes, uh, birthing modules, and uh, other special equipment they were doing for special missions, and now Harpoon being brought into the mix. Uh, that's going to be a delicate balance based on what the mission planning is and the expectation of the respective COCOM and where that submarine is being deployed. So, um, but that's that hopefully gives you a sense of that. So I'm expecting to see that kind of kicking off in the next year and we're talking to maybe about five to seven submarines will get that in their next spiral development, the capability to shoot Harpoon. Sure, if I might just uh, pick up on that, I wanted to highlight, you know, the Commandant has been pushing us uh, very hard in this business of long range precision fires and certainly maritime fires are a really important component uh, of that. So talked in uh, opening remarks about, uh, you know, the Marine Corps operating as a fleet Marine force in support of uh, assets at sea, uh, wanting to be able to cooperatively deliver uh, fires uh, in support of uh, sea control. A uh, couple of the key components that the Commandant is pushing us on, first is the pursuit of a long-range advanced uh, anti-ship uh, missile. Uh, he is an impatient man, a man of many uh, positive qualities, but, uh, you know, so we're talking a relatively uh, near-term capability uh, that uh, we're making a significant investment in uh, now. Uh, the second is the ability to apply loitering munitions, you know, multi-mission, multi-payload, uh, that uh, kind of expand some options for combined arms, what we would describe as combined arms effects. Uh, against a, uh, a target. And then the third is uh, aviation delivered ordnance. And uh, uh, F-35 opens up some really uh, interesting and valuable space, we think, for the Naval Force. And the F-35C in particular, uh, because of uh, its enhanced payload and uh, some of the unique weapons that it's able to apply, that are a little bit different than what the B offers. But in the same manner that the submarine forces wants to expand its range of options, we're thinking about uh, Marine Air Ground Task Forces from uh, land-based locations uh, able to support those kinds of requirements as well. Admiral Daly, you have a question. Well, thank you, Admiral Zortman. Um, on behalf of the Naval Institute and EPSIA, we thank the panel. A quick question, you know, when you look back at uh, what we've been doing, a fairly permissive environment. If you were a Marine fighting in the streets in Fallujah, you didn't think it was too permissive, but those Marines didn't have to deal with a lack of air cover or control of the logistics that supported them. On the Navy side, we sent P3s over land to use their EOIR capability and lost perishable ASW skills. There's examples like that in the air-to-air -air skills on the aviation side, uh, whether it's Navy or Air Force. Have we developed a couple generations of naval officers and Marine officers who don't, haven't been had, held accountable to the multi-dimensions required of the full-up lethality war fight that's been discussed so much already here this morning. In other words, they've only had to think through a couple aspects of the problem, but not the full integrated problem. So we've talked about toughness and resiliency and how difficult that is to instill. How about changing that mindset when it's really, we've really been there almost since the uh, end of the Cold War? Yes, yeah, so I'll, uh, you know, with regard, we're, we're, we're struggling with a term, well, we're, we're trying to redefine the X, redefine the target. So we're thinking more about, uh, you know, that the, the target is not only the physical, but it's the virtual and the cognitive piece. And uh, it really kind of ties into undervaluing the influence line of effort or IW that I would say that we learned in the CT realm, hopefully that sometimes the influence line or the IW piece can be the main effort. If you look at the CT fight, um, probably some of the most powerful things we're doing is military information support operations where we're trying to target audience to influence behaviors with regard to uh, getting after the seed of why people join, lost souls join a, a lost cause. So I would say the IW piece of uh, the CT fight, I would say as we move into great power competition, we can talk about lethality in high-end conflict, but uh, we're trying to think creatively about those other domains and what soft brings uh, creatively to the virtual, the cognitive piece, and how we partner with 10 Fleet or we partner with, uh, you know, with our submarine brothers uh, to get in and do some things that will influence and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, because I really think it's a long ball game. I don't think great power competition is about frontal conflict, even though we need to prepare, it's more about influence and how do we do that across multi-domain. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hop in on surface side. Uh, I, sir, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look in, in our surface community, uh, we've gotten very good at air defense, defense, and we've gotten very good at ballistic missile defense. But we have not, you know, we, we've really gotten away from the offensive lethality piece from a surface ship standpoint. And I think that, uh, you know, I think the ASW was also lesser valued in surface ships uh, in the last many years. Uh, and I think that has changed dramatically. I mean, we've, we've dramatically improved the number of ships that are out there with Victor 15 suites. Uh, you know, we're over half now, which is uh, really, really a, a, an aggressive uh, move for us. We've put a lot of money into it. Uh, but the long-range ship thing between ships and submarines for long-range uh, missiles and faster and longer-range missiles is really a key priority for us right now, as is commonality. Uh, that's another piece. I think we all fought in our stovepipes. Uh, the air wing went off to fight ashore. The ships kind of protected the carrier. The submarines did their thing. And I think now we're realizing that we have got to do a lot better with our tactical integration uh, and our, our warfare development centers. I think if you ask uh, Admiral Miller what, what's happening up at Fallon with you know, my uh, surface warfare witties and his witties together briefing uh, some of the most in incredible, uh, you know, war fighting tactics that I haven't seen in my whole career. Uh, similarly, on the surface side, we're bringing out maritime strike tomahawk missile, a dual capable tomahawk. We're bringing out naval strike missile. This is a brand new missile. We just awarded it last year. We want to deploy it this year. If we do that, we've got to have it be ready to manned, trained, and equipped to perform in theater, and we're going to try to do that. I don't think we've done that type of speed to fleet uh, acquisition and fielding in my career. And so uh, th there's this confluence of, of things meeting people, uh, and it capitalizes on the warfighting development centers, and we've just now, Admiral Brown can talk about uh, their new warfighting development command that's, that's adding probably one of the most important piece because it integrates all of the things we do together. So uh, I, I really am excited about where we are going and we are learning quickly and we are uh, catching up because we did let it go for a while. And I, I think, uh, make no mistake, we are, we are very good at what we can do today, but we're going to be much better because of this shift in mentality. I could can add. I take a question from over on the right side here. Can I, can oh, I add, go ahead. I just want to add one, one piece to that that answers, I think, another dimension of the, your question. And I think all the Navy component commanders, uh, Admiral Aguilino, Admiral Fogo, Admiral Grady, are thinking about this. And it really is how we do rearm, resupply, and repair in a, in a contested environment. So it is this logistics piece that you're really kind of talking about, how we're going to sustain the fight in a place that's, uh, that's not just going to be where we dominate. And so, you know, we talk a lot about dynamic maneuver, but this is more kind of dynamic posture. So when you think about how we're posturing forces and how we're working with allies for access and some of the creative things we do with MSC and some of the full spectrum logistics pieces, that's going to be a big piece of everything that uh, Emerald Boxwell talked about. Sir. Yes, I have a, a recommendation going back to your question, Admiral Zorman. Back in the mid 80s, I was very fortunate to go through department head school right after the Falklands War. And they had a uh, Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander who was a PWO on one of their Type 21 frigates that was sunk during that war. That was the last war a Navy's ever had to fight in three dimensions over a sustained period of time. And what was fantastic about the four hours we spent with this man is he had 35 millimeter uh, slides that he took throughout that entire uh, war. And uh, it, I would suggest that it might be good to reach out to the Royal Navy for their um, experiences um, and bring that into, back into SWAS because it was fantastic. The Thank question. You. Oh, go ahead. The question I have is, after the sinking of the Chinon, there was a lot of effort put on by the Navy to fix torpedo defense. And I'm curious, do we think we've gotten after that Achilles heel? Well, I do a lot of torpedo defense in my portfolio. So one of the key elements to torpedo defense is, is uh, knowing where the bad guy is in the first place. And, uh, and so we, we are very good at those types of things, I and mean, obviously unclassified for them. Uh, one of my concerns for ships and for submarines is, you know, as we look at, as we look at the adversary submarines, their threat is shifting from torpedoes to cruise missiles, very, very long ranges, uh, and, and that's kind of, in the great power side, uh, a threat that's, you know, to me, now something that, you know, they don't have to come in within very close range, they can now do it at very, very long range. So we've now, again, put a premium on locating in the first place, ensuring that we, we know all those, uh, 
you know, where they're operating. So if we're, if we are, uh, we've done, spent a lot of time in the last many years that Admiral uh, Daly just talked about uh, playing defense, uh, waiting for them to come to you, waiting for the missile to come, for the airplanes to come. Uh, this shift in mindset for defense is your best defense is a good offense. And the idea that we will go after the threats at range is something we haven't been able to do in, for a while, whether it be uh, ships, submarines, or aircraft. Uh, and the adversary is doing the, are doing those things. And so we need to go after offensively to prevent being in a position where we, we try to build uh, uh, such a robust defense and go broke playing defense when, in fact, we can significantly uh, improve our own position through an aggressive offensive posture. You know, our surface forces, uh, we work up with them all the time. And we're bringing to bear the most sophisticated torpedo in the world. And uh, one might think that it's like shooting fish in a barrel, but it is not. Uh, our Arleigh Burke destroyers have a, a very good sensor suite, very good sonar, very good radars. They push us back further and further. They detect the incoming, and they actually have very good tactics, techniques, and procedures to counter it. So uh, I think as far as a defensive piece, if it, you know, if it's always best to keep it at arm's length. But uh, in the actual uh, 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 piece of actually being shot at, they're actually very, very good at what they do. And, uh, and that comes from a lot of practice with us. I'll yeah. tell you, with the uh, integrated nature with which we fight, and you know, then bringing in the you know, aviation side of that puzzle with H-60s and P-8s, um, and then how we train to that fight, I, uh, I, I think it's definitely an area that has our attention, and, can, and as it should, and uh, uh, we continue to evolve how we fight uh, so that we're ready to win that in that environment. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Captain Yuri Sef. I'm out of Fort Huachuca, Arizona, Joint Interoperability Test Command. Uh, slightly above the level of what uh, Admiral Boxall brought up about individual readiness, uh, there's a concern in my organization about uh, logistics support readiness in the event of enemy action, cyber action, physical action that will result in a significant loss of assets, whether entire communication suites or, God forbid, entire ships. Do you foresee any sort of logistics changes we should be anticipating in the near future, or are we good where we are, or do you see just tweaks? Hey, uh, good morning, Marine. Thanks for being here, and uh, thanks for a great question. What you highlight is one of the most significant challenges. Uh, it's been suggested by uh, the panel in terms of how you rearm, refuel, uh, refit in forward locations. Uh, so as we look at uh, the future operating environment, we expect that we're going to have significant challenges projecting and sustaining forces in forward locations. So while uh, we need to think uh, a bit differently and are, are working actively uh, on, uh, on the project with, uh, with the Navy about uh, you know, how we approach pre-positioning, uh, you know, what we want to have in place that we can benefit from sort of in early phases uh, of a campaign, uh, we think, we're thinking about uh, long-range, unmanned, autonomous uh, connectors and distribution assets in order to move fuel and ordnance uh, over con uh, contested operational uh, ranges. Uh, and then uh, we're thinking about how we apply different combinations of amphibious assets and other elements uh, of the fleet in order to be able to benefit uh, from their ability to move uh, fuel and ordnance and then tie into the, the embarked MAGTAFs uh, connectors, you know, to kind of close the last uh, tactical miles with the delivery of fuel and ordnance. Uh, we anticipate we're going to have to, you know, kind of uh, play three-card money constantly with uh, where we seek to conduct uh, our rearming, refueling, uh, and, uh, and refitting uh, from. So it's going to be a very active game uh, in order to make targeting challenging. Um, but we also see value, uh, operational value, and imposing costs on them trying to chase where we're doing those activities and where we're generating combat power. Uh, so kind of to the broader point, it's a, a different operational uh, game and different operational challenge. Um, but we, we think there's some promising uh, techniques and procedures, and we think that there's some promising technology that will help us get after that. But it's going to be a fight. Yes, hey, can I add, um, so one thing we're looking at that this may support your point is, is the vulnerability of the blue in protecting uh, some of the things we take for granted in great power competition. So we're calling it identity management. A need to, uh, you know, increase CI, OPSEC, force protection, and, and then digital footprint in those, I would call, you know, tail portions of the tooth. 
So we've got to really look hard at, at our vulnerabilities and our signature, our digital signature, and we, as a force writ large, uh, I think those disciplines about hardening the blue and, and, and being able to uh, harden the ability for asymmetric actions by peers with regard to those supporting elements of uh, high-end warfare. Yeah, I'm going to hop in from ship. I mean, distributed maritime operations puts a premium on logistics. Uh, so if you're going to operate your forces like we do today and we're going to spread them out, it just makes sense that you've got to have more of those things to, to do that. But there's another side of this is one is your own vulnerability as a force. And one of the things in the surface side is, you know, we could keep putting all kinds of systems on every ship and make it, you know, this, this impenetrable force and that's going to be a very expensive force. Or we can go the other way and say we can put out a lot of unmanned uh, systems out there that, and expect that you will take some casualties but you will, you will, the network will prevail. And so I believe that there's two, two prongs. We've got to get better today on the, uh, on the former model because, and I think we know that, how we get them, uh, again, you know, Admiral Daly is one of the things that probably took, took, uh, took a beating over the last couple decades was our logistics force and the recapitalization. However, it also presents an opportunity of doing things in a different way. Uh, we're pushing a lot in our unmanned programs, our large unmanned surface vessel program, our medium unmanned that's out operating today, the Sea Hunter that you see in the waterfront here in San Diego. Uh, and again, smaller pl platforms, we're going to put a, a new, very capable multi-mission frigate uh, with vertical launch capability on a, on a, on a ship that's going to be uh, about half of what it costs a destroyer to do out there today. Uh, and, and, you know, part of that is, is creating more platforms that can do those same things with long-range missiles that can, that can reach the enemy in more places. And so, therefore, if we lose some in the future, we, we have the ability to make it up with capacity as well. You know, at the heart of the, all these things that these gentlemen are talking about is this idea of mission command. And uh, it's something we, you know, you have to have the ability to understand you're not going to be command and control through some higher headquarters. So the local commanders are going to have to self-organize, communicate with one another, develop superiority at the point of contact, and execute the mission in an environment where there's not going to be a lot of uh, C2 coming from the uh, HQ on land somewhere. So this idea of taking commander's intent, the mission, and locally organizing is kind of inherent to all these discussions. So, so Daryl, that's a great lead into a, <clears throat> a question that your, your leaders in the community uh, in uh, how you identify, select, and enable commanders. Uh, there, there's a perception, I think, in some quarters that uh, the force has become risk averse, that that initiative that commanders need locally uh, isn't necessarily present or being exercised in a way. I, I, I think it would be useful to hear from uh, different people here. H how are you as a community viewing that and how are you uh, getting that, develop, finding, developing, and enabling commanders to do the kind of training and demonstrate their ability to perform uh, in those trying conditions that don't come from Central Command. Yeah, I'll kick off just real quick to let others, because I mean, most people in this room know that's inherent in submarine force. I mean, because we're not expected to communicate a lot. We're very much like special forces in that regard. And so uh, we do have some enabling technologies that's improving that. But when, when I hear that commanders aren't being given the authority to actually operate as a commander, to, to your root question, it should be to everyone in this room and certainly at this table offensive. And uh, because that is the nature of command, we select these folks to actually be in charge of these vessels and to empower them with the authority and responsibility to take that fight and deliver the actual effects and ordinance that they need to do. So I think you'll see that's, that's a myth, what you just said. That's not happening. And uh, if that's being uh, espoused in some way, I don't see that in any of our communities. You know, it's interesting. You brought up uh, Admiral Lockwood. Uh, earlier, and I think he was, uh, if I have my history right, Daryl, on submarine flag officers, he, he was famous for, um, if you will, calling the hurt uh, of multiple commanding officers that, that, um, that he didn't feel had the toughness and, and were risk adverse and, and replacing them with those that, that did. I, I agree with Daryl 100%. Our entire leader development strategy has those conversations where we sit down with uh, um, our 06 major commanders to our 05 commanders and matter of fact uh, coming up here next in two weeks we're having uh, 250 junior officers where you know that are coming to San Diego 
and we're having an exchange of ideas between junior and senior leaders, but it's where we have that opportunity to have those kind of discussions about what is valued. And to be honest with you, a lot of what's valued is we, we show that through our selection boards. And so getting those precepts right to say war fighting is, is, and lethality is what we value and then making sure that, uh, that we're rewarding that by selecting those folks for command positions and then making sure that they're prepared to win when they get into command. Hi, uh, Jeff Zalewitz with Navy Times. Uh, Rear Admiral Boxel, this question's for you. Uh, you talk about the surface fleet uh, returning to a culture of excellence. My question is, when is the rest of the fleet, when are the American taxpayers, when are the parents of these kids going to see proof of these reforms? You, you know, uh, Senator King at a hearing yesterday asked Admiral Davidson about this and said, where is the metrics? You know, where is the data? You know, GAO reported a few months ago that sailors are still working 100-hour weeks out in Japan. You guys still have a senior quartermaster uh, billet shortage, among other things. So when, when is everybody going to see some proof in the pudding, uh, so to speak? Okay. Thanks. First, you had a couple, you mixed a lot of different things in there, but I'll, I mean, first of all, I mean, the ROC, we've been very, very open as a Navy on the things we're doing in response to those, and we will report those to the Hill and we'll continue to do those. So I haven't seen uh, 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 the Senator's recent comments on that, but uh, certainly uh, we have a very tight uh, communication path back to the Hill, and if, if uh, he doesn't think we're doing well enough, then we need to d get better at that. So we'll take that on, I'll pass that along. The, the, the other piece, you talked about some of the outcomes and the metrics and what we're using. I mean, we, you know, first problem one is to figure out what you're going to change. And then when you change, is that making a difference? Uh, you brought up Manning, a uh, very tough problem. This is not something that generated today. You can't grow a senior chief tomorrow. That, you, you know, I, we, truth in advertising is that we were billeted uh, and funded for about 98% Manning uh, in the surface fleet. So the billeting and the funding of the billets was not the problem. We do have some distribution issues in, uh, so that was manpower, in manning of actually getting the people where they need to be, and that's a very real problem that we're going to have for a little while, and every one of us up here is going to have to endure that. Uh, it will take years to, to, to rectify that. Um, so uh, in a broad sense, I mean, we uh, did a lot of work as a Navy, led by the, you know, the BCNO and the Undersecretary of Defense, or correction, Undersecretary of the Navy, uh, leading us every week uh, in this uh, readiness, uh, this review in the ROC, um, that we have a very clear lines of accountability uh, and that is continuing to work every day. That has not stopped. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take us some time to, you know, we're, we have to move money, we have to make changes, and then we have to just see what it works. So it will take time, um, but we do already have some metrics in the near term of things that we're doing uh, in, the, in the, the, the points along the way that we are increasing the uh, quality of the of the types of training that we're doing, the number of hours, the, the fidelity. Uh, we can show you those things, but it's going to take time. We've got to buy more systems. We've got to get higher fidelity trainers, and that's not going to happen overnight. So uh, appreciate the question. I, you know, we, we want to be as open and transparent about this as we can be. Uh, and I, you know, we have, our money's where our mouth is. As I said, we've got over a billion dollars in these types of issues in the near term. Uh, they'll bear fruit here soon for us, I'm sure, to increase that. Any encouraging metrics you can cite offhand? Uh, I, I can't offhand. I mean, again, man, train, equip, and those things are really not necessarily my lane, uh, but, but we have them. I just don't have them personally, uh, but I certainly can pass that along to the waterfront. We'll, have, we'll get those, whatever ones you're, that you need specifically, and let us know. I can, I can add one piece to that. It's, I can tell you that in the commander's update briefs that we have with Admiral Aguilino in the Pacific, there's not a ship or submarine that heads west that's not at the proper manning when it deploys. So we are green in manning before a unit gets underway. Now, that's, there's still shortages, and we have to manage that very carefully. But I can tell you the N1s of the world are, are under the thumb of our commanders to make sure that we are all up around from a manning perspective when a ship goes west. Sorry, I, I didn't answer your one question about the actual uh, the studies that have been done, because that was tasking direct from the Hill. Uh, we have done those studies on surface ships, for example. We've increased the number of folks that are going to be on destroyers. You know, we've done in-port and underway work week reviews, and the result of that review means that we have a, a greater requirement for folks on destroyers. That's going to happen on submarines. It's happening on uh, carriers. It's going to happen uh, across the four deployed fleets. So 
So those will have an impact. I mean, it won't happen overnight, but uh, I can guarantee you that we will have more people on those ships uh, than we had even before at a very high manning level. So while the denominator will change, uh, you know, we may actually go down in the percentage of people we have on board, but the requirement will have gone up. Uh, more to follow on that. Those will be the metrics you should challenge us on, and I'm, I think you'll be happy to see that we are moving in the direction that we, we've been directed. Thank you. Admiral, so I, I'm a Cold War submarine skipper, uh, vast attacks, and a great student of Jim Hornfisher. Uh, reading him, his battleships were unable to dislodge the Japanese at 5,000 yards on Saipan. Could we do Saipan again today? I don't want to answer all the questions. Yeah, uh, I, I, that, that's a, that's a um, I think that's a question of, that isn't just about battleships shooting uh, big 16-inch shells into uh, defilade positions. It's only 14-inch shells. Well, that's all right, Admiral. But, but it was. I mean, but, but, but it was. But, but, but your question is valid because I think it's a question of an integrated fight that had a significant combat logistics uh, part of it. It was. Uh, it was combined arms of. Uh, aviation from both carriers and from uh, land-based. It was uh, Draper Kaufman uh, bringing, really inventing uh, the SEALs uh, as part of that. Blowing I, holes I, through coral. Right. I haven't, can we ever do that again? So, so the, the, the question is, uh, that in that particular thing, I think is a, uh, could, could that level of force be brought to bear against a place like Saipan? I'll let each of the panelists, if they have an opinion on that, uh, the, the, the other part of that was just mass, hundreds of ships. And I think the answer in the hundreds of ships category would be no, not with the force we have today. With other capabilities, uh, maybe. Over to the panel. I might just uh, hop on because uh, amphibious operations are such an uh, important component of the Marine Corps' contribution to the, uh, the Naval team. The first thing I would say, sir, is it's a different type of uh, amphibious operation. You know, so we want to be able to achieve you know, what we would describe as kind of all-domain dominance for the critical window of time that we need in order to be able to project force. So that's the application of the entire Navy team, the entire uh, Marine Corps team, and, and frankly, other elements of the Joint Force uh, are key players for our ability to be able to do that. So all-domain dominance, the window of time that we seek to uh, maneuver in, uh, we have to be able to operate from greater ranges. There are some really important capabilities that contribute to our uh, ability to do that, and then to operate with precision. So, uh, you know, clearing very large frontages um, and, uh, you know, being able to close the force to, you know, really tight ranges are things that would be super challenging, um, maybe impossible in today's environment. But if we operate with precision, uh, we extend the ranges that we're operating from, um, we're able to achieve kind of the uh, integration uh, across all domains that is necessary for us to own that battle space for the necessary period of time. Uh, we can uh, project force across the joint team and across the naval services uh, in order to be able to create a lodgement or to establish capability ashore. We're thinking that, hey, you establish that capability ashore, how do you reverse the thrust vector and then apply that capability in support of sea control, but we might also be thinking about sustained operations ashore, but a different uh, type of amphibious operation than what we executed at Saipan, and I think it's a really important point for all of us to keep in mind. Take, I think we're down to maybe one last question, so. Uh. Great, thank you all for being here. Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Um, we've already heard a lot about uh, sort of the training and certification periods before deployments being compressed, especially due to some maintenance challenges. So as you all look to insert uh, new capabilities, such as the Naval Strike Missile and the Harpoon Missile, uh, as you look to insert new, um, new, you know, the CNO talked about conceptual agility this morning, as you look to sort of modernize warfare, how are you inserting that into the training and certification period without overburdening those sailors? Um, that's a good question. It's easy to oversubscribe ourselves. And, uh, you know, if we're not careful, we will bring too much on our, our uh, for me, FRTP or FRTP uh, process. Um, so we do have to kind of, at our level at this table, integrate that in in a very deliberate and careful manner. And so the, I think our system allows for that latitude. 
I think it's built in that we can bring a new system online through mobile training teams, through uh, uh, SOVOTs, through testing and processes and um, things that we have in place through um, the existing infrastructures that bring those new technologies to bear are pretty well equipped to integrate in at a certain pace. So I think if we bring a new weapon system in or a, a CRAM or when you had a CWIS, uh, that type of level of change, we can absorb that. What we couldn't do is some you know, wholesale change out, but I think a weapon system, a new missile system, the commonality of how we manage information on board, the look, form, fit, and function of our technology screens allow the adaptation of new weapon systems and how we control those much easier than it was in the past. So the sailors are more, I think, able to actually bring a new system in because of the way we build the underpinning IT. That's a fair criticism, Megan, but here's, you know, there's two sides, again, you know, you're going to have risk, right? There's risk by not having the new capability, and there's a risk of bringing that capability on at a pace that's too fast for the system, right? We want to find that right balance. But in the past, I, can, I think we have overstepped and waited till we had it perfect, till everything was in place and we put everything out there. And there's an opportunity cost to going slow. And we've not acknowledged the risk associated with that, whether it be in a shipbuilding program, an aviation program, or a new missile, whatever it is. Um, we just say it's got to be perfect, it's got to be there, and we got to have to have everything in place. I think we've got to aggressively challenge ourselves. This is a much faster adapting world than we have lived in, and it's only going to get faster. And in this high velocity environment, we are going to have to accept risks in some new places that we haven't in the past. I would argue that we should accept it in places where you're going faster. Okay, now we'll take the last question, really. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Paul Zolja from Task and Purpose. This is for uh, Admiral Green. Uh, sir, there have been a number of high profile cases uh, of SOP personnel uh, being accused or found guilty of uh, professional or ethical violations. You had SEALs um, dismissed over drug use uh, very recently. You've got SEALs currently under investigation on trial or on trial for murder charges. Um, head of SOCOM put, up, put forth a memo talking about ethical, um, uh, ethical standards. I'm wondering what steps you're taking, sir, to get NSW off of the skyline, so to speak. And um, are, these, are these cases indi indicative of uh, a larger cultural problem? Okay, let, let's, the, the, the purpose of this panel is lethality and readiness of the force. And so if there's a question in there about lethality and readiness of the force. I, I, I would, I would a, say that readiness of the force uh, would include SEALs being ready to deploy and, and you know, not being you know, uh, I agree. So, so I guess the question is uh, readiness of the SEAL force in terms of training challenges. Is Correct. that a, okay? Yeah, hey, that's a fair question. I appreciate you asking it. And uh, it is something I'm looking at hard. Um, you know, we, I, I just commissioned, I had an 06 that came back from Iraq, so he just certified commander, and I had him look 90 days at what we're doing, what we're doing in the schoolhouse, uh, what, what we're not doing, what we're doing relative to uh, leader development and hard ethical decisions, combat ethics, to see if we're addressing that through our interdeployment training cycle. So we are addressing it. Um, and we are looking hard as a learning organization uh, to self-assess, to see, you know, are we assessing and selecting the right people? Are we holding them accountable to standards, honor, courage, commitment? So I would say we're on that. Uh, and uh, I, I, I just chartered a 90-day assessment, like I said, and I'm going to get the results from him, and we will address those. We're really looking at, um, you know, how we integrate that, that continuum of leadership development and hard discussions. We've been at war for 17 years, and, uh, and those are the things that we are looking. So we are on it. So I appreciate the question. It does affect readiness. Thanks, sir. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Okay, I think we're getting to the end of the time. Uh, I'd like to thank the members of the panel. This is a, this is a tough business. Uh, they're, they're in, uh, they live at the crux of the stuff coming and the stuff we got today, and they're charged routinely with making sure the people and the equipment that's in the force is ready tomorrow, it's ready next week, and it's ready 18 months from now. So uh, I, I'd like to ask for a hand for uh, the panelists and the great answer.
behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA, I'd like to thank the panel as well. This is a great conversation. Uh, for those who are not here today, you can watch this on YouTube. All of our uh, panel discussions and speakers will be available on YouTube, on uh, the Naval Institute U YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and, and hear some parts of this, do so. If you want to tell your friends and colleagues who were not here that they can uh, catch up on what's uh, the content of the, of the conference today uh, and the next couple of days, they can do that as well. I've got a, a, a memento of thanks for all the panel members. Uh, third edition of Fleet Tactics and Naval Operations, so the Bible of Tactics by Wayne Hughes and Bob Guerrier uh, just came out in uh, 2018. So thank you again for, uh, for your time and for your insights today. And I uh, look forward to uh, uh, talking to you uh, during the, t the uh, break time. Hey, by the way, uh, hey, before we, the, uh, com this panel started, I snuck up here and changed boxels in my name tag. So you had to sit on the scene. <laughs> but submariners, man, what they'll do to you, right? Well played. Well played. Nice. <laughs>